How many of you guys remember the theme from the last Sunday? Okay. What is the theme? Be careful what you mutter. Be careful what you mutter. So, how many of you intentionally managed to mutter a lot in the last one week? Thank you, Ash. That's one hand. So, you guys been managed to meditate quite a lot. How many of you guys felt really strong in the last one week? Strong. Be strong and courageous. How many of you felt really courageous in the last one week? Awesome. Awesome. But very few hands, relatively. I think we need to talk to Pastor Nan once again, is it? <laughs> it's a work in progress. Amazing. But yes, that's true. So what we would be doing is, what we touched upon last uh, Sunday was everything in the context of a discipline in terms of how we meditate on the Word of God. What we would be doing is, we'll do a small recap of uh, what we studied last week and we will continue forward on how the journey of Joshua really had took him through these highs and lows of this discipline of meditating on the word of God day and night. Right? So let's go back and read Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 to 9 once again and we'll take it from there. It says Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 to 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the U river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful, Father God, for this opportunity to gather amongst your saints on the Lord's day, oh Father God, as you've commanded. And Lord, this privilege to meditate on your word, to read and to understand what you're trying to tell us, oh Father God. As we continue to do it, oh Father God, I ask and pray that every heart be open to receive your word. Every eyes, Father God, every, every ear, so Father God, be open to what you are about to teach every single one of us, Father God. As we continue to do it, oh Father God, convict our hearts of the truth that it might not just, that we might not just be the hearers of the word, but truly go on to be the doers of the word, oh Father God. I commit the rest of the time into your hands, oh Father God, knowing and trusting that your presence is here, oh Father God, amongst us, and that you are the one who is taking control of this whole time. Thank you once again. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. What a beautiful chapter it is, right? Right from the beginning of this chapter, it is God who is reaching out to Joshua and talking to him and encouraging him. As we uh, studied a bit 
last Sunday, Pastor Nath was sharing that there could be multiple reasons why God is reaching out to Joshua and telling these things specifically to Joshua. There is this extended emphasis on him asking the people to be strong, uh, for Joshua to be strong and courageous. How many times that God says this phrase to Joshua in this passage? Did anybody get to count? About three times, right? The number where the extra emphasis, holy, 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 verily, verily. So whenever a word is being repeated over and again, we know that there is an emphasis that God is placing on this. But if you look at this, he says, be strong and courageous. Now, if we have to just quickly step back and ask, be strong and courageous to do what? What is God encouraging Joshua for? Be strong and courageous to do what? Is it a very generic statement? Just to be strong and courageous? No? Yes, that we are all. But what is God pushing Joshua to do? To? To lead, okay. What else? To conquer the land, okay. To face people's tantrums, wow, that we definitely need strength for. <laughs> what else, what else, what else is there? What is the Bible very specifically and clearly saying? What is God telling Joshua? In verse seven, he says, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to the law that Moses, my servant has commanded you. He's saying that, you need strength and courage to do what I have asked you to do. That is the strength and courage of the highest order. When we think of strength and courage, uh, we, if we are making it very generic, yes, all of us need the strength and courage to go about our regular life. That is, that is something that every human being needs to face the world, to kind of understand and go through the highs and lows of the world. But here, when God is telling this to Joshua, he's very specific. He's saying that you need strength and courage that you may observe according to the law. You need strength and courage to do what I'm asking you to do. You need strength and courage to do what I'm going to ask you to do. Right? If God is able to build that strength and courage in any person's life, I believe every other worry would automatically be taken care of. Because we know that we as people who are called to God are always called to the highest standard. Not just a higher standard, we call called to the highest standard. Highest standard that we in our own capacity cannot meet, but only in our communion with God and only with the help of God, we can derive that strength and courage. That's the premise that God is setting. So even to Joshua, he's saying this repeatedly, that you will need strength and courage to do what I have asked you to do. You will need strength and courage to do what I'm going to ask you to do. And that is precisely why he's saying that. And we know that maybe, Joshua as a person, he feels that probably he's not good enough to fit into the shoes of the, his predecessor, Moses. He has journeyed with Moses for a long time. Maybe he has seen how, how taxing probably it was for Moses. Or maybe he believes that he's not good enough for this role. At times, we probably think that whatever God is calling us to do, maybe we're not good enough, right? But here is a God who's, who is the one initiating the conversation is God. It was not that Joshua going and complaining, saying that, God, how do I do it? It's not God responding to Joshua's initiation. It is God who is initiating the conversation with Joshua and who is going on to encourage him, right? And he's saying that when you find the strength and courage 
to do what I'm asking you to do and you do get to do it, you will find two things. One, you will be, your ways would be prosperous and you will have good success. Is that something that God is trying to say, Ki, hey, from a worldly perspective, you'll have prosperity or good success? No. And this is something that we know is from God's perspective. If God is the one who's setting the standards for what does prosperity mean or prosperous way means, what does good success mean, one thing that we can be assured of is that this is going to last more than what I can think of. When we think of prosperity and success, how many believe that it is everlasting from a worldly sense? A successful business or a successful career, we know that any of it or all of it could just vanish in a minute. It's still not the strong foundation on which we can build our lives on. But the prosperity and the success that would come by doing what God has asked us to do will have an eternal or an everlasting impact. Because that is what the word says. If you are going to find the strength and courage to do what God is asking you to do, that outcome will not just last for a short time, but it will last for ever, right? So, and, and then he, is, he goes on to say that he is going to be with Joshua wherever he goes. But if you look at the verses, five to nine, God is very intentional in how he communicates these ideas to Joshua. How many people like detailed communication or a structured communication? How many struggle with people when you're trying to listen to somebody and that person is just running around in circles and kind of beating around the bush? How many people like that conversation? No. Hate that conversation? Okay. Awesome. Right? But we see that God is really structured in his conversation. Let's kind of see how the structure he builds from verses 5 to verses 9. Let's read just verse 5. He says, No man shall stand, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. See that in the beginning of this, what is God saying? He's given Joshua a promise. Hey? He starts off with a promise. Is he preceding that? Uh, is he first giving a command and then making a promise? No. Is he first stating a mission and then stating a promise? No. Right? He is always starting off with a promise. And then verse 6, it says, Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. There's a mission. Right? He says that the reason why I have tasked you is not just to conquer the land of Canaan, but once it has been conquered, you are going to distribute this land amongst the 12 tribes. That's a mission statement, right? But the beauty is the promise always comes first. Even in our encounter with Christ, what we are first given is not what we are called to do. What we are first given is the promise. A promise of life, a promise of resurrection, even our encounter with Christ. So we see the, the similarities between how God communicates and the way things unfold as well. And then in verse 7, it goes on to say, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all that the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. And that is a command. His command is not just to be strong and courageous, but his command is to keep the law. Right? So, 
you see how god is unfolding his plans step by step to joshua and bring him into that confidence and then verse 8 it says this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success now he's stating a practice he's not only given joshua a promise he's not only given joshua a mission he's not only given joshua a command but he's also going on to say how you're supposed to do it you're supposed to do this every day day in and day out only in that practice will you be able to accomplish the mission only then you will be able to follow the command only then you will be able to realize the promise again this promise that god is uh, setting before joshua is something where joshua will understand over a period of time maybe the moment joshua uh, heard this from god do you guys think that joshua understood the full extent of what the statement means no. or what this promise means no. no right but we know that god is breaking it down and he's saying it as and when you keep doing this step by step you will grow in understanding of what this promise means right and last but not the least verse 9 it says have i not commanded you be strong and of good courage do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the lord your god is with you wherever you go and then god leaves joshua with an exhortation that in order to do all that i'm asking you to do i will be with you what greater assurance would anyone need need right you see that do you see a full a whole rounded conversation between god and joshua yeah. that god is saying you see the beauty with which god layers his communication and i believe as we try to look to his words it's the similar way where how god wants to speak to each and every one of us and that is precisely why god is encouraging that hey look to what i have already told you then you will be able to see what i am revealing to you and then you will be able to understand what i'm going to ask you to do right and that's the beauty that we have in this conversation so if you ask why are we setting all this context is that we'll see how joshua takes all these different elements from this communication and then tries to put this into practice and how he kind of sees through the highs and lows of the journey okay and when god is asking anybody to build this discipline has the journey ever been easy no anybody for whom it was very enjoyable <laughs> no right but we see that joshua how, how many believe that probably joshua struggled to put this into practice yes. did joshua struggle yes yes sure yes okay <laughs> so we know that when joshua immediately like what we see in the following verses in uh, chapter 1 and then all the way until chapter 5 what we see is Joshua at this point is somehow able to put some of these things into practice. The immediately after that this step after the conversation with God, Joshua goes and kind of brings all the people of uh Israel to one place and he communicates the plan of action how they're going to cross the river Jordan. Right? And then he also sends spies to the city of Jericho to go and see how this uh how this land of canaan is and how the city of jericho is and then he get, and then you hear the story of rahab who kind of hide these spies from people and then she finds favor in god's eyes and after that you actually see these people crossing the river jordan similar to how 
Moses parted the Red Sea. There is similarities between how uh, things happened in the time of Moses versus how things have happened in the time of Joshua. This is for the people of Israel like, to put their trust in Joshua, to see Joshua as the successor to Moses and somebody who to, with whom uh, God is in uh, communion with, right? And that's what we see. And post that, we see that the whole nation of Israel does get to cross this river. And that is the time when the whole nation, a completely new generation uh, of uh, Israelites are circumcised, circumcised. The reason why we say a completely new generation is because we know that in the 40 years of wilderness, the generation which probably complained, which did not believe, God had taken enough time so that that whole generation kind of pass away and there's a completely new generation. So this new generation is circumcised after they cross the river uh, Jordan. And that is the time where even the manna that has been feeding this whole nation, the food from heaven, ceases from that day onwards. Because on that day, they had come to the point where they could eat the produce of the food of land of Canaan, the promised land. right? And we see how God has truly unfolded this journey for the previous 40 years. And here they are at a place where Joshua is taking over. Joshua has successfully uh, taken the nation of Israel. They have crossed the river Jordan. And this is where Joshua is. In Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15, it says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Right? Imagine, right? After all that, God has probably told Joshua in the first chapter, what did he say? He said that no man shall stand before you. I will be with you wherever you go. But maybe, even after all of it, Joshua had led a few battles, even through the wilderness when Moses was leading it. Does anybody know how many battles probably did the nation of Israel encounter or uh, participated in during the wilderness time? Any guesses? Yes, no, maybe. Huh? And Amalekites. That's one, yeah. Only one battle? Sun stood still. That's Joshua's battle. I'm talking about the Moses battle in the wilderness. Any guesses? I asked somebody in the morning, uh, in the Barnet service this morning, somebody's guess was 57. I said, wow, that's, that's really by faith. But the total six battles uh, that, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, the nation of Israel uh, participated in. So the reason why I'm saying it is Joshua is not new to battles. But this is the first time he's leading one. So even after this constant reminder that God had to communicate to Joshua, he probably still struggled. So maybe that is why he was all alone by Jericho, where he kind of met this strange person. right? And he was struggling through that thoughts. It is interesting how many of us probably are similar in a way where even after clearly hearing from God, we still doubt our own abilities. Because what has been communicated from the beginning is that you, I'm not trusting you, I'm not picking you not because of your abilities. I'm going to pick you and I'm going to use you because 
I am going to use you. That is what God is saying, right? But we always fall back and look at our shortcomings. Very relatable, right? Absolutely. But here it is. Then he lifted his eyes and looked. Behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Very relatable question, right? Especially when we are going through this anxiety and the stress of any particular situation in life, the only question that we are asking God is, God, are you going to make it happen or not? Are you for us or you're not? Please tell it clearly, yeah. right? That's the question. But here, Joshua is asking the strange person, are you for us? What is the stance of this person? He has a sword in his hand, a sword that is not probably in the, uh, what do you call it, quiver or something, but it is uh, shield. So it's probably drawn, a sword that is drawn. So the question that Joshua is asking this person is, are you for us or you are against us? Why does Joshua want to know? If he's against us, is he going to fight this person? We don't know, right? We don't know the reference why Joshua is, but the only thing that is still running through this man is the battle that's ahead of him, right? So what does this person say about himself? Who is he? He is, he says something. He uses a very interesting phrase. He says, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. Any guesses who this person could be? Right? Did anybody? Okay. Any guesses who this person could be? Archangel. Okay. That's a fair guess. Any other guess? No? Who? Lord himself. Okay. Great. What else? If it is Lord himself, why is he calling himself as the commander of the army of the Lord? That name means there's a lot of hosts. There may be a lot of? Lot of hosts. Lot of hosts. Okay. Okay. So we have two possible explanations. of One, probably it could be an archangel or the Lord himself. Right? Okay. The reason why we believe it is some form of Lord himself is because what does he say? When Joshua hears the statement from this person, what is Joshua's response? He just falls on his feet and worship. Does this person deny that worship? No. In turn, what does this he say? He says, take off your sandal off your foot. That for the place where you stand is holy. Does this phrase sound familiar to you guys? Yeah. Where? Moses. Moses and the burning bush. Absolutely. Absolutely. We know that. But did Moses encounter a person there? It was just the burning bush. Right? But what we understand is, this is definitely not just an angel, but the Lord himself. But Lord himself in what form? In human form. When we look at this, what we understand it, it, this is the second person of the Trinity. It is Christ himself, the pre-incarnate version. Any reference of God in human form is always the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament. And that's the beauty. What we're seeing here is Joshua encountering Jesus at that point in human form any reference across the Old Testament, whenever you come across probably this phrase called the angel of the Lord. And that phrase is God representing himself in human form. There is no other form. God would not take any other human form except for that in Jesus. So this, what we're seeing is the pre-incarnate Christ. But the, here is the interesting part. God, Joshua was having a communication in chapter one with God. But when he came to this point, did he recognize this God? 
No. God is revealing himself in a very new form that Joshua has not seen. Right? So from that, what we understand is, in, in the last few times, jo God has asked Joshua to do something, and Joshua has been diligently been doing these things. What we see is, while he is obeying God, and he's, ask, he's doing everything God is asking uh, him to do, God is revealing more of himself to him. So what we understand is, progressive obedience brings progressive revelation. The more you listen to God, the more you obey God, the more you will understand God. We see that very clearly. At this point, we are, Joshua is kind of blown away that he has always seen God probably not being a part of the battle. But here, God himself is representing in human form in in what form? Uh, and, and he's as the commander of the army. Somebody who is kind of ready for battle. Has you, have you ever pictured Jesus in this form? As a commander? It's hard, right? But the beauty is, Jesus is that. That is what he is telling about himself. It's not a man is attributing this idea to God. Or to Jesus. It is, Jesus himself is talking about the about himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. We know that in the second coming of Christ, the way in which he would come, he will not be coming as the lamb. He'll be coming as the commander, as the lion. Right? You see, you're able to join the dots a bit now. But what you're seeing here is, this is God revealing more of himself to Joshua because Joshua has been able to faithfully do what God has been asking him to do and to follow what God has been asking him to follow. That is the power of the discipline. When you are able to build that discipline to reflect on what God has already told you and what God is continuing to tell you and what God is asking you to do, when we fall into this habit and this discipline of doing it day in and day out, you will encounter God in a fresh way from time to time. And there is no greater blessing than that, to know God more and more through that time. And that is, and when we kind of have a greater revelation of God, our, the way we worship God will also get elevated. The way we adore God, the way we revere God will also get elevated. But the thing is, all of it is not possible without us doing what is already told to us. If we are content with what we already know of God, our journey, our worship, everything would probably grow or do at a very small pace or a very steady pace. But that is not what God desire is for his children. Right? So Joshua is constantly being drawn to this. And even here, he is not only just saying that, does uh, God respond by saying that I am for you or against you? No, he doesn't. In a way, he is saying that I am for my own, I'm, I'm my own. I'm not even kind of getting into this idea of am I for you or against you? Because even when Joshua is asking, are you for me or against me? The only thing is what Joshua is asked to do, what Joshua is doing is actually what God has asked him to do. So even if Joshua thinks that somebody is for him, that is only because God has already given it to him. So. God, in a way, he's saying that, hey, your thought process is always in a limited perspective. Are you for me or against? But he's saying that, no, my perspective is much bigger. But my perspective is not just in the context of this battle. Joshua is struggling in his thoughts that, hey, how am I going to win this battle at Jericho? But God is saying that, no, my picture is much bigger than that. I'm not even looking at this battle alone. Right? And then we, we see that he, he truly 
kind of encourages Joshua in this manner. And if you look at the, the following uh, things that follow, what we see is God is asking this commander, Joshua, what is his strength? He's a strategist. He is somebody who knows how to kind of take his army and go for a battle. But what does God ask Joshua to do? God asks Joshua to take his priests and march around the city of Jericho and just worship him. What kind of battle strategy is this? We all is, know the story. But if we have to put ourselves in that place, what is our first go-to? As much as we are aware of our shortcomings and weaknesses, we are also probably very aware of our strengths. Okay? But what God is asking Joshua to do is to keep his strengths aside and do what God is asking him to do. Is that an easy one? If I know that I am good with something, how much do I really care about relying on God? If I have to use that strength. Right? We usually go to God with our weaknesses. But, this is where actually God is truly training Joshua. He's asking that do not rely on your strength. I know that you probably know how to win battles in your own strength. If, just let's step back for a moment and understand that if Joshua actually went to the battle in his own strength and he must have won also, who would have gotten a more greater glory? Joshua? Or greater credit? Maybe some, or maybe it could be Joshua and God. Right? In some or the other form, our hearts are also at a place where the glory that we want God to be glorified and in some form, because of our strengths, because of the confidence in our own doings, in some form, we also want to share in that. Right? It's not that God is against it, by the way. Let me tell you that. But it is more necessary for God to refine our hearts in that process where God is asking Joshua not to rely on his strength, but to rely on God alone. It was necessary for God to kind of have this message drilled through Joshua so that he's prepared for the battle ahead. Joshua might be thinking only about Jericho at that point, but God's perspective is much bigger than that. It's not an easy one to kind of lay down ourselves in this manner, right? And that is something that where he says, even in the New Testament it says, deny yourself. The process of denying is rejecting myself, very ironic one, but the idea is, I am not relying on myself with my strengths or my weaknesses, but I'm constantly relying on God. And that is a very beautiful thing that Joshua is getting to encounter. Did he have to do it before this? No, but God knows at what point to intervene and share this message with you. So in that, he sees that he is able to conquer the city of Jericho even without lifting a finger, just by lifting their voices. That's an amazing testimony in itself. And after the city has been conquered, they kind of uh, pull all the spoils of the city and God asks them to use all of it for the temple and keep it for later. Basically, kind of bring it into God's house. But then, they are heading towards the greater cities of the land of Canaan, and then there is this small city called Ai. The word is Ai, not in the way we understand it these days, but the word is Ai, the city of Ai, a relatively very small city, as compared to the huge and large fortified city like Jericho. Ai is small. so. Joshua again sends spies to this city to go and see how this uh, city can be conquered. So the 
spies that Joshua sends, they come back with a report saying that, hey, you know, this is a very relatively small city. We don't need to, the full force to go on a war with these guys. All we need is probably 3,000 men that are good enough. Let the other men rest. What we'll just kind of take this 3,000 men, go attack the city of Ai, and we'll come back victorious. Nothing much. You see, immediately after, something that has been taught to them, not to rely on their own strength, what are these guys doing? Precisely what God is probably intending them not to do. In this whole process, if you go and read, we'll see that they did not even take time to consult God. Whether should we go and to war with city, with the city, is this the right time? How should we do it? What should we do? There's no consultation. So these guys actually take 3,000 men and attack the city of Ai. And what results in is that these uh, people of Ai, they overpower the city of, uh, the, they overpower the Israelite army and to the, way, to the point where the Israelite army is turning around and running yeah. away, turning back. And in this process, there are about 36 men, who, Israelites who lose their life. And that is something that is really hard for Joshua to process. Why? Why is it very hard for Joshua to process? What did God say in Joshua chapter 1 verse 5? He says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. That is what God said. That is God's promise. What you are encountering is a defeat. Does that mean that God lied? No? But when we look at similar things in our own life, when we look at our own setbacks and shortcomings and failures, though we have received word from God, how many times do we end up questioning and doubting the same? Right? But you, we also get to see the response that Joshua had. Joshua chapter 7, verses 6 to 9. He says, Then Joshua tore his clothes, and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening he and the elders of Israel and they put dust on their heads and Joshua said alas Lord God why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us oh that we have been con we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? We see Joshua responding in his emotions through all of this. He's experiencing pain, grief, defeat, shame, hopelessness, agony, complaining, dissatisfaction, anger, doubt. All of this he's kind of sharing with whom? Sharing with God in his prayer, right? How many of us probably have experienced the same thing? The first question when anything goes wrong, is why? why me that's the most common question why me we keep asking why me until god responds and we have to hide our face in shame right but it's a similar so but does god condemn that ask we see that god actually does not but what we really need to understand is that in those situations god is allowing the defeat god is that allowing the defeat and he goes on to explain the reasons as well. But we just need to step back and understand that what is Joshua going through? Somebody who has probably built the discipline of meditating on the word day in and day out. Somebody who has led these people over the river Jordan. Somebody who has through God's help has been able to take over the city of Jericho. This person is going through all these emotions, right? And how long did he stay in that emotional state? 
What does the Bible say? In chapter, verse 6, it says, almost a whole day. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of uh, Israel, and they put dust on their heads. So we see that this person is going through emotions for the almost a day. Right? But when we probably have to encounter something that is so grave and serious in our own lives, we probably spend days, months, maybe years. It depends on the severity of what we have encountered at some point. Right? So what we understand here is your time to arrive at the right perspective is inversely proportional to your godly disciplines. The better your godly disciplines are, though God allows room for all these emotions to take place, you will not spend it or waste too much time wailing through these emotions. Let's read that again. Your time to arrive at the right perspective is inversely proportional to godly disciplines. But let's see, let's see how much time. So we see that probably Joshua went through all this probably over, over the whole time during the day. But, and there are about three to four statements that he makes. What I believe is probably Joshua is not making all these statements all at once. Okay, so let's read this. In verse 7, he says, And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To deliver us into the hand of the Amorites? To destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Does this tone of questioning seem very familiar? Similar to what the Israelites were complaining in. Is Joshua any different? Right? In that, he's saying this. But what is interesting is, do you see God intervening at this point and responding to Joshua? No. Right? We don't, God does not respond to this at all. Then, the next statement he makes. That, oh, this is very interesting. Oh. Uh, he says, oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. I was better off. How many of us in that moment of weakness and despair and going through all these emotions say this? Had it not been for this situation, I was better off. Right? How many of you had made that statement? I was better off before, right? Probably like something like, I was better off when I was single. <laughs> but yeah, it's, we'll not go there. But let's understand this, right? There are times we go through all these um, emotions. But does God respond to that? He doesn't respond to that either. Then he says, Oh Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back from their enemies? That's a very shameful thing to accept defeat and to run. Have, have you been in that situation at any point where you had to run from a situation? I know that we kind of run from situations. That's not what I'm talking about. But it's mostly an intentional choice. But we do that, knowingly or unknowingly. Right? But he's saying that, Lord, what about all the shame that is going to come? That has already, that is already upon us. And then he says, For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. This is where the imagination is going wild. How many have the, this gift of imagining the worst situation possible when we are going through this? and we brew in that situation alone, we imagine the worst. Our creativity is at the peak <laughs> at that point. We imagine the worst 
and we brew and we start complaining to God about that situation. Right? But God does not even respond to us. How many of you guys were comforted by God's silence through all this? None, right? It's hard to understand God's silence, especially when we are in that ride of just complaining and going through this uh, wave of emotions. But then, Joshua says something very interesting. Then what will you do for your great name? What will you do for your great name? And that is when God responds. He gives Joshua enough time to complain, to vent out his emotions. But he's intentionally not responding probably. But he's waiting for Joshua to f come to a point where he's looking at God's name that is at stake. It is not the lives of the people. It is not the Israelites. That, that is important. But it is not the most important thing. What is the most important thing for God is the purposes and the plans of God. So Joshua takes time through all of this. By the end of the day, he probably comes to this statement or this perspective. But God, in the midst of all of it, what about your name? That is when God responds. You see how it's very clear, right? So we probably get stuck with that emotional ride alone. And when we do not hear back from God, we do not take time, or at least we are unable to kind of build a bigger perspective. The reason why we get stuck in that emotional ride and not able to kind of uh, broaden the perspective is because the only thing in most cases what is missing is the discipline that has, God has already asked us to follow. But because Joshua has been able to follow that discipline and put that, he does went out his expressions, but he's able to come to a point where he's looking at God at the middle of all of it. What is at stake is your name, right? And that's the beauty. And then God responds and he clearly works with Joshua to tell him what really happened, what went wrong. If you read, uh, go back and read the story uh, in more detail, it says that there is one person in this whole army called Akan who goes and does what God has asked them not to do, which is keeping a part of the spoils of the city of Jericho, some uh, silver, some gold, and an attractive coat. He kind of goes and takes it for himself, whereas it was supposed to be for God. There are two things. Did is Joshua directly responsible for this? How many believe yes? And, or how many believe no? Why is Joshua kind of responsible for all of this? You guys think Joshua is responsible or he is not? He is? Okay. Sorry? Partly. Okay. But what does God say? God says, by responding first to Joshua, he says, get up. Get up from this. Basically saying, come out of this. I will show you the reason what has actually happened. He goes on to say, that the Israel has sinned against me. The whole nation of Israel has transgressed. That is where we see the aspect that God has in mind is, if I'm calling you as one church, one nation, one community, even if somebody falls, one, you're supposed to take care of that person so that he does not do it. And especially from a leadership perspective, God is calling that leadership to a higher standard, saying that you should be taking care of all of it. One thing what we have already established is, before going to the battle, if Joshua would have consulted God before that, maybe he would have revealed what had happened. He would say that, hey, maybe I'm not going to be with you on this battle because this is somebody who has disobeyed and you have the responsibility to go and correct it. Right? But here is a God 
who's waiting and giving time. But we do see that Joshua, in some form, did not do what he was supposed to do. So in that sense, Joshua is responsible. Okay. What we do not realize is, especially when we face these kind of failures, is that it's hard for us to take that ownership. But this is the beauty. When we are able to humble ourselves and kind of come to a perspective that God is showing us, and we are willing to listen to him, he is going to reveal what exactly went wrong, right? He clearly shows, he asks Joshua to bring the whole nation of Israel, then Joshua divides these people by tribes and their families, and then God narrows down on the family, uh, on Akan, and we see that his whole family is punished because of Akan's uh, deed. But, what we realize is that Joshua is able to follow everything from there and also rectify the mistake. And this is what we need to be prepared for. That in when we build these disciplines, the disciplines do not directly guarantee that you won't find yourself in situations something like this where you're probably experiencing a failure, or it might sound like a failure, or a defeat, or a shame, or a setback, or whatever it may be. But the, what the discipline will help you is to come to the right perspective. And if we continue to obey God, He will also help us identify where we messed up. So that the journey ahead, we do not do the same thing again. That is why God allows that defeat in the first place. In that whole process, it might seem and sound as if God is not with us. But it is again what you're feeling, what the emotions are. It is far from reality. When we come to the point of understanding and reflecting on God's word and coming to the right perspective, He will respond. He will definitely show where the gap was, what was the missing piece, what was the root cause, what are our blind spots. What are the areas that need correction? And he will also guide to help in helping us to understand the necessary action that needs to be taken. That is how a discipline looks like. Discipline is not just building a routine. Discipline is learning and growing through all of it. And we see that even what he experienced uh, before Jericho when he encountered uh, the commander of the army of the Lord and even here, do you see that Joshua is understanding a lot and growing and learning a lot in this process? And all of it, I believe from God's perspective is absolutely worth it. Some setbacks and some are absolutely worth it so that God is able to speak into your life at that point. So when we face this, what is important, the first and foremost is the discipline which is, which is going to help us in coming out of the situation as soon as possible. And the other thing is, how much are you able to trust God? The hardest thing for us to kind of experience through these setbacks is to trust God. But if we have a discipline that is established, which is constantly reflecting, he says, meditate on this day and night, meditate on what I have told you, meditate on the word of God, and also make yourself familiar with the works of God. If you're able to familiarize yourself with the works of God, you will understand that this is the reason why probably God is pointing you to something which you have not been paying attention to. And that is what the beauty of this discipline will do. So, it is utmost important that we focus on this discipline. And there's only, and for God, from God's perspective, it's not a big ask. He's asking us to focus on one discipline alone for Joshua. He says that go and Meditate on this law day and night. 
That's the only ask. Everything else will follow. We know this in our heads. But it is so hard for us to go and implement it in our lives. How many of us probably kind of made this commitment that I will finish reading the Bible in one year? <laughs> and how many actually did? Amazing. I see a few hands and it's brilliant. But it was not just a one-time activity, right? That is something that we're supposed to do year on year maybe. To know more and more, right? But it's not that. We're supposed to meditate on it day and night, which is going to feed into our lives today, which is going to speak into the situations of what we are going through. And that alone is going to guide. This discipline alone will change the entire life. Your entire thing. How many probably, you must have heard, you know, some, some people who have really built disciplines or maybe some business owners, they go and talk about how much they have meditated on the book of Proverbs. Right? And some of the business principles, they build their business principles on their life. Somebody who is into health, the word of God says that, that your body is a temple of the Holy God. You need to be careful how you treat your body. You need to take care of what you eat. You need to be mindful of what you eat. So you see how, and Bible will talk about finances, Bible will talk about relationships, marriages, emotions, everything. If we are able to build this discipline of meditating on it, it has the power and the ability to speak into every life uh, situation and also be able to guide you through those situations. That alone will change your entire life. That alone will bring a greater revelation of who God is into your life. Where I'm telling you the blessing would be that your worship will not be the same. Your adoration will not be the same. Your trust will constantly increase in this God. You will start seeing God in your daily situations. Not just in the highs and the lows of your life, but He will be become as real as the person that Joshua encountered. Right? And in conclusion, what we see is, what do we need to build this discipline? There's only one thing that we need, is the determination to build this discipline. If the determination is absent, everything else you might try, but you'll not try enough. Right? It's the determination. You need to be determined to follow God's discipline. How? Any strong-headed folks in the house? I'm there. The strength of these strong-headed people are is that determination. Once you set your mind to something, you just want to finish it, right? You want to do it. It's true, and I definitely admire all the health freaks, they've built a discipline. I mean, when I say freaks, like in a good sense. <laughs> the gym rats. So, the idea is, they have built that, but it did not start there, the journey was not easy. Through all the setbacks, what was working through is this determination. And what we know is, determination is a function of your will. And when we look at the context of will, your will is all that you have to offer God. Everything else is from God anyway. The clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, the homes that we live in, everything is from God. There is anything that we probably give out of it is something that we can only give back, but not something that is on, of your own. The, if there is anything that you're giving back to God or, or giving to God, not giving back, is your will. If you are determined, the ask is that be determined to do what God is asking you to do. That determination is going to carry you through all that God is asking you to do. In order to have the determination, that is where the strength and the courage 
that God has asked you to have will play a vital role. You need to have a strong determination. And you need to have the bold courage to see the perspective that God is coming from. Right? So, it doesn't matter if we probably had taken some big oaths at any point and probably failed to see them through, especially the ones that God has uh, asked each and every single individual. Even in the context of probably reading and studying the word of God daily. But it's not late. It's not late. And the other thing is, it's necessary and important for that to become a part of your daily life starting today. And what you need is that determination. The only ask is, are you willing to have the determination to make this a part of your daily life going forward? If it doesn't matter how busy your life is, it doesn't matter how hard the situations are around you today. But if you want those situations and those circumstances to change, what needs to change at times is our response. And our response will not change by itself unless we submit that to God. And that only will come out of this discipline. Thank you for tuning in for that message. We really hope that that has blessed your heart immensely. At Zealous, it's our desire that Jesus would meet you at the point of your need and that you would truly grow in the love in the grace that he has to offer each one of us. And that's why if you have been enjoying the content that has been coming to you, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel, to share this content with your friends and your loved ones, and maybe even consider partnering with us as we take the message of the gospel beyond the four walls of Zealous. Once again, it means so much for us when you join in. So thank you for being here with us. God bless you and may you have a great week ahead.